My name is um, Alex Rosbach. I teach in the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies. And a lot of my own research takes place in Nepal and is centered on Nepal, albeit more on its religious, particularly Buddhist, rather than its political um, institutions and history. It's a great honor to welcome Kanak Ji back to campus. Um, I'm so delighted uh, that you're sparing the time and that you're with us. It's, the term is just over and it's very balmy weather outside. We had quite a lot of events in the last days. So I'm very happy that uh, we have a great turnout um, even though the date isn't technically speaking ideal. But it's always ideal when you're here. So that's not a reason. <laughs> Um, Kanak G doesn't really need uh, any great uh, introduction. You're all here uh, to hear him, and you know whom uh, you will be listening to in a moment. He um, earned his uh, BA degree, as um, would be fitting in his generation, at Tri Chandra College in Kathmandu. He earned his Bachelor of Law at Delhi University. And then he moved to the States and he earned two successively two MAs, uh, one in international affairs and one in the science and journalism at uh, Columbia University. And you, as you all know, he's a foremost uh, figure um, in the world of um, intellectuals, in the world of journalism, in the world of activists. He is um, a voice of sanity. He's somebody who stands up in Nepal where things are not always going the way they ideally would. He's a voice for democracy, for freedom, for civil and human rights, for accountability, and he's put himself out there at considerable risks to himself. And I very much hope that one of um, you know, the really great achievements of Kanak G's, the Malayan South Asian Journal, will be back um, you know, operating before too long. Unfortunately, because of the shenanigans of uh, politics in Nepal, it had to suspend publication. But it is a very important um, organ, a very important uh, outlet that allows to see South Asia as a cohesive political space. It's a little bit of an irony that the Indian government, uh, of all governments, is undermining that vision in the way it has been treating SARC recently because as you rightly point out in your prompt, really the vision of um, South Asia as a coherent space, as a subcontinent, is the Indian world before its political fragmentation in the colonial and post-colonial period. Kanak is not only a very important journalist who founded uh, important uh, journals and newspapers, and given a space for political expression, he's also expressed himself, him, himself as a journalist, as a political activist, as a translator, as an author of children books. And beyond that, he's been very important in facilitating a film festival, film festivals, I should really say that again, bring the South Asian space together and speak to his tireless work as an advocate of somebody who bridges rather than cements political divisions. Um, he's also an activist beyond the literary scene, beyond the film scene. He's been working on spinal injury, rehabilitation, public accountability, public transport, archi archiving in animal welfare, uh, uh, ecological themes, and uh, together with his wife Shanta, who's with us tonight, He's been deeply involved in education and pioneering what is probably the best private school in Nepal that is run outside of um, kind of expat hands <coughs> and uh, making a very important contribution also to public education um, in Nepal. Um, it's a pleasure for me to host this uh, event also because it's only a year that we launched a new initiative here on campus dedicated to Himalayan studies um, with a generous uh, gift um, from Keiko Yamanaka and uh, the late Jerry Berriman. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been, since coming to Berkeley, I've been deeply invested in doing something for the visibility of the study of Nepal on campus 
and I'm delighted that we have these new tool tools. In 2005, we had a public affairs symposium entitled Democrats, Maoists, and the Monarchy, Nepal at the Crossroads, which took place at a very critical moment. It's the time of um, the political upheavals of the recent past. Um, earlier this year, we had a symposium, a small symposium on the earthquake in Nepal and its aftermath and the coping of people. And it reminds me of one other of the many hats that, and contributions that Kanak has done, namely to the Kathmandu Valley Preservation Trust. I was in March in Kathmandu, and I looked at the site of Swayambu, which is dear to my heart. And being myself um, a board member of this particular trust, of course, I went to Mangal Bazaar. You know, he showed me around, and I've seen the work done. And it's really amazing to see what different standards are being met and what is possible if the stars are aligned properly and if people like Kanak lend the political weight to things and what things can go wrong if that doesn't happen, which unfortunately up to now has been the case at Swayambu. So I was, I must say, I was very impressed, Kanakji, by what I've seen and it's wonderful that it also serves as an extension of the museum and I can see all the good coming from it. Um, Kanak was also here in 2011 as a guest of the Graduate School of Journalism here on campus and he then gave a very insightful talk about the political situation and latest um, movements in Nepal. Um, I'm glad that today he's enlarging upon this and he will not restrict his comments to Nepal but he will, in a sense, hearkening back to what I said at the beginning, he will talk about um, the effects uh, the Modi government has had upon um, the sense of political cohesion across the subcontinent, the way it has um, impinged Sark, and something I think really important in the time we are in, um, by myself being from Europe, I'm delighted at the result of the French elections um, yesterday and I was less delighted about the Brexit vote, I'm less delighted about what goes on in Poland and Hungary and other places. And this is where somehow, um, you know, my own sensitivity is. But of course, very much the same dynamics take place in this country, and they also take place in South Asia, and I think we are so absorbed by what is happening here and in Europe that we don't fully uh, pay attention to what's happening um, in India and in South Asia. So Kanakji, thank you very, very much for giving yep. us your time and speaking to this. Yep. Please thank you. Thank you, Alex. And uh, of course, it comes very naturally to me to talk, to get right into talking about Nepal. Uh, the blockade, the earthquake, the reconstruction, but sadly, the topic today is in a rather larger frame. Mm. Uh, so if you do, you would like to delve into Nepal specifically, perhaps uh, over coffee afterwards, or question and answer later on. But let me go right into the topic then, and thanks, thank you very much, South Asia Institute, pa Alex and, and friends, for <laughs> having me here in Berkeley uh, uh, to speak on a topic that uh, is very much mine, but not as a scholar. Very much mine for having been a South Asian journalist. Not a journalist from Nepal, but a journalist, I would like to think and believe, from South Asia. Uh, realizing the hurdles, because when we converted Himal from being a Himalayan magazine to a South Asian magazine, we thought it was, it would be done rather easily. We didn't know at all that uh, the entrenchment of the nation, uh, of nation statism, let's use that term, to the extent that given that journalism essentially uh, responds first and foremost to national politics. And that's <coughs> where the, in Nepali we say the taltal lies, the, uh, the, the excitement of doing, reading, being immersed in, following national politics. South Asia is a different breed altogether. It's something in the making. In some minds, it's a romantic idea, not at all feasible uh, in these days of the nation state. And therefore, uh, we realized that therefore the market was also very slow to respond. So Himal has struggled for the last uh, 29 years 
as a Himalayan magazine for the first 10 years and South Asian magazine thereafter. Uh, which means almost two decades of trying to understand South Asia. And perhaps the best way to do it, if one is not an academic, is to be an editor. Because in dealing with copy, in dealing with concepts, in challenging and working with writers, trying very hard for them to shed their uh, national uh, proclivity or bias in writing, in backing away from that particular edge, that has been a learning experience, and I guess some of what I'm saying will come, therefore, from my, not my scholarly background, which, I, which there is none of that, but my, my journalistic background. So the, I'll divide my presentation into two, two arenas. Uh, the, the talk is built, of course, as South Asian regionalism in the time of Narendra Modi, um, Prime Minister of India since uh, 2014. Um, but to, before I get into that, I will have to, therefore, use the first part of my presentation to talk about the concept of South Asia. Because if the concept is not even useful, there is no reason to worry that Mr. Modi is doing some harm to it. And hence, to uh, present uh, the views that we have sort of, me, my colleague, my uh, current uh, editor of Himal for, uh, for the last four years, five years almost, has been Onaita Mojumdar, and many editors previous to that, uh, including um, associate editors, Lakshmi Murthy and, um, and Vidyadhar and uh, Deepak Thapa, uh, going right back to when even Manjushri Thapa was with us in 19, early 1990s. Um, so I hope to be able to take from all our experiences as I present to you the idea, the idea of the concept of South Asia, because conceptualization has not yet uh, proceeded. And that is probably how I'll end my presentation. Uh, towards, uh, right at the end, I will talk about the need to go back to the idea, to the drawing board, uh, not to the drawing board, but to the, uh, the work of conceptualizing South Asia. Because certainly not enough study has been done, not even by the South Asia Institutes of, South, of the world. Um, so firstly, there is an, uh, a sense that South Asia is synonymous with SARC which is not true at all. Because SARC is one way to consider South Asia as a conglomeration of eight countries of the region. And that is a very important entity or organization, the SARC, the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation. Better that it exists than it doesn't exist for sure. Uh, and it is weakened and it, through the weakening of SARC, we are also seeing a moving toward the weakening of South Asia as a concept as well. That is why it is important to talk about what is happening to the SARC organization. Uh, put that squarely in our cross crosshairs. But to go back to the idea of uh, the importance of a South Asian concept. Firstly, how do you carry the history of South Asia in the modern day? You either will carry the history through a fractured way in which each country each nation state uh, is there creating its own narrative of the history and then you bring it all together it becomes a protoplasm and you say this is South Asia or you also think that perhaps there is a need for a complementary identity beyond the provincial beyond the faith-based beyond the linguistic beyond the tribal or the ethnic and then if you go through the unit of governance beyond the city or the tehsil, or the uh, district, or the state, or the province, state in India, province if you speak of Pakistan, mm -hmm. then you go to the national identity. My proposition is that you have to add the South Asian identity to the mix, to be connected to the history, and to be able to plan for the future. To the history, there's no doubt about it. South Asia as a whole, in different times, with the ebb and flow of empires, and different uh, regions, and sub-regions, and countries, it certainly had a shared history, if not a, definitely not a unitary history, but a shared history. But the proposition is that you also need a South Asian concept to head towards the future. And that is why we need to conceptualize it. And that is why if there is a weakening of South Asia, including through the weakening of SARC, we are probably doing harm to our own future. 
And because there is not enough study of South Asian regionalism, we may not even know that we're doing harm to ourselves. And that is the specific point I want to make here, that we are not considering enough what could be, what do we, is there a different kind of a idea of South Asia beyond that propagated by SARC. And, but we need SARC to move into the other areas of conceptualization. And the idea some people have is SARC, this idea of South Asia is actually a little romantic. It is, um, it is a little peacenik oriented and it leads towards everybody feeling good with each other but achieving nothing. I think that further study, a deeper study of South Asian regionalism in the direction we want to go would indicate that essentially we are talking about a social justice project. South Asia can fully conceptualized and implemented without necessarily doing harm or without pointedly doing harm to the nation state. This is the point that the South Asian regionalism is not meant to harm the nation state but to bring in a complementary or a, if you will, a supplementary idea that will help us identify ourselves and also look at each other with slightly different eyes beyond the angry, xenophobic, ultra-nationalistic nation-state eyes. Because essentially what is nationalism and what is ultra-nationalism becomes almost meaningless once you start <coughs> considering how the various nation-states of South Asia have imbibed their sense of self, how the capital elites, Delhi, not Bombay, Islamabad, Rawalpindi, and not Karachi, and Dhaka, and not Chittagong. These elites have essentially using the nation state to maintain themselves, and then there is the enmity created by the nation state. You need the enemy to energize your own fold. So there is also a, a maintenance of enmity in South Asia, all of which mitigates against the kind of South Asia that is probably going to make it a social justice project. And another element, the fact that it is a social justice project, needs to be fleshed out and discussed and studied <coughs> by the economists, the sociologists, the political scientists. I can only suggest to you that my own reading is that it is going to lead to us to everything from the peace division to the dividend to the reduction of uh, militarism in each of our countries, militarism, reduction of militarism in each of our countries, the synergies across borders, uh, the economies of scale, um, et cetera, et cetera. There is no doubt that if there were uh, softer borders, within existing nation states and more of an acceptance of the idea of South Asia, you would actually lead towards, uh, towards social justice, as I said. But the other point to make is that it is not, there is not an attempt at the supranational South Asia. The criticism comes fast and furious that you're trying to create a nation state of South Asia, nothing of the kind. In my own reading, I could be wrong, in my own reading, it goes in the other opposite direction. The more South Asia you talk, the more local and sub-regional you become. Because what we are talking about is historical India as well, if you were to use the term, was not allowed to evolve because of the colonial interlude. It may have gone in certain, several different directions. One of the directions it could have gone is where you have soft borders between the countries, existing nation states of South Asia, and you've got more space and devolution of powers given to the provinces of the larger countries. We're talking about, we're talking about Balochistan, we're talking about Sindh, we're talking about Tamil Nadu, we're talking about Assam, because there is no other entity we can create right now. So we have got to go with the entities that exist. The devolution. So essentially, South Asia that we perceive in Himal is the kind where uh, nation states exist as they do, that there is devolution of power to the provinces and ultimately right down to the Gram Panchayat, the way, uh, that is the way of South Asian regionalism, not 
a supranational super government on top of it all, perhaps headquartered in Kathmandu, <laughs> where the, where the Sark, uh, Sark Secretariat uh, resides. <laughs> There's a one idea, and before I let go of this concept and move into then what is happening under the Modi Raj in India for the South Asia as a whole. I might say, I've been toying with this idea. I'm a little hesitant to present it here, but I think I will risk it. Um, what the British tried to do was, of course, create, or what they did do was create a uh, centralized state for the subcontinent. And it seems that the independence movement of South Asia as a whole, independent movement against the colonial British, relied on essentially reinvent, not inventing, a copycat, uh, copying the British model of centralized rule. To me, this is worthy of note because there may have been other visions for South Asia. And certainly there were individual units like Hyderabad did try to go it alone. Junagar did try to go it alone. Nepal managed to remain also because it was not colonized, uh, politically colonized. Nevertheless, all of South Asia, the mainstream narrative of the independence movement was to continue what the British has left off itself with Soraj, meaning you're ruling yourselves. But it was a super elite left behind that was going to be ruled. And then there was partition. Partition led to uh, two countries using British models to, of centralized rule. Now, we're talking about a, con sub -con a continent with a prefix sub. It's a massive space with the kind of identities and communities uh, and nations, if you will, in quotes, uh, in quotes, all over. How do you bring it all together under one umbrella? The British did it because they were colonials. So I think what happened right there and then is you needed ultra-nationalism to bind South Asia, <clears throat> the individual countries together, particularly the largest, India and Pakistan. And it really helped the elites of both countries that there was partition. Because then you can build the enemy and therefore consolidate yourself. I would like to think that had partition not happened, perhaps the evolution of South Asia or what then would have been India as historical India, which wouldn't have Nepal as part of it, but nevertheless, the bulk of India as we know historically would have probably bifurcated into, um, sorry, uh, divided into many uh, zones within the nation state, if you will, but perhaps we would have had a different kind of experimentation of the Westphalian state in South Asia, the way it was perhaps not tried elsewhere. Because the South Asian genius in an unpartitioned post-colonial India which would have been a unitary, un a unified India, would have probably evolved in the area of the kind of South Asian regionalism that I'm proposing today. With that bit of a, that's the first half of my presentation, to say that there is a need for South Asian regionalism in my mind, uh, and it can be complementary to the nation state. It will promote uh, more democracy in the provinces, in the grassroots. It will not promote this centralized nation state where what the television station in New Delhi or Islamabad says today carries the entire nation state by the buffalo noose. That the decisions made in the central uh, newsrooms and produced by the central producers and television producers is like a constant news but no depth because the, the sense of agency of the citizenry in these, especially, I'm really focusing on the larger countries. The sense of agency is gone. The way I feel, we feel the sen sense of agency in Nepal. That's another topic, another time. But that there is something to be said for a unit, I won't say sovereignty, but devolved power for smaller units where you can see that the end of the road for you for success, for a person from Assam, is not to have a voice in Delhi, but enough to have a voice in Guwahati. For somebody from Chennai or from you know rural uh, Tamil Nadu to think that I my achievement is to make things happen in Chennai rather than Delhi. To me, Nepal provides a Nepali citizen for all the mess that you see in Nepal. It's an experiment in progress even today. 
but probably there is a sense of agency that many people do not have elsewhere. Which is why when people say, 20 years of mess in Nepal, and how come you guys are still surviving? How come the public don't lose heart? Some of it may have to do with the unit of governance combined with devolved power, which you may also call sovereignty, uh, and the unit of uh, governance, which is enough to make democracy kick in. What happens now as Mr. Modi gets sworn in on 26th of May, 2014? In a show of bravado, which is the way he does things, he decided to firstly have the inauguration under the open skies, uh, under Raisina Hill, and then he invited all the heads of states and government uh, from the neighboring countries. Only Bangladesh uh, sent the speaker because Sheikh Hasina was engaged in Japan at that time on an official visit. Everybody else came in, um, heads of state or government. Uh, and so people thought, wow, this is, means that now the South Asian century is upon us. Uh, but what you realize is that um, it is not quite, it was never that simple. Mr. Modi uh, is a centralizing force. And uh, within India too, perhaps, I don't know what the, exactly the GST experiment is going to do for centralization, but on the whole, I see Mr. Modi as a centralizing force within India. And within South Asia, his vision seems to be South Asia, uh, regionalism, uh, if not under my command, then at my dictate. And um, so what happens is, right after uh, the inauguration, we had the SARC summit. And uh, the SARC <laughs> summit was uh, on, Modi swearing in was May 2014. The SARC summit was uh, on this 18th SARC summit. Happened in uh, 2000, uh, 26, 27, November 2014. In the, at the fag end of uh, Mr. Modi's inaugural, uh, in his address to the SARC summit, he makes a very interesting point. I'll, I'll have to read it out for you. He says, uh, because this was a time when uh, the SARC organization was trying to get through, uh, push through a, as one of his star activities, uh, a motor vehicle agreement that would allow especially cargo vehicles, trucks, to move easier through the various uh, border points of South Asia. Bangladesh, India, Nepal, India, Bangladesh, India, Nepal, uh, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, <coughs> etc. So <laughs> it wasn't working out because uh, Islamabad was very recalcitrant. And either in a strategic moment or in a huff, or in a bit of bravado, Mr. Modi says that the bonds between the countries of South Asia will grow Quote, through Sark or outside it, among us all or some of us. Almost poetic. <laughs> <laughs> among us all or some of us. This was a very pointed reference to Pakistan. And that is where now I would like <coughs> to make my, uh, my presentation. Uh, uh, the last segment of my presentation is essentially talking about how Sark as an organization is weak, uh, but it needs to be kept alive. Uh, the foot dragging in the SARC organization has mostly been done by Pakistan. Still, pa SARC needs to be kept alive. The foot dragging is done by Pakistan because it has, it had the least buy-in on the SARC concept, even in the initial years, uh, because SARC was started, uh, inaugurated on 8 December 1985. It was essentially the brainchild, to begin with, of Ziaur Rahman, the president, the then president of uh, ba Bangladesh, and. Uh, it, then it was uh, taken up uh, with uh, energy by the kings, uh, the king of Nepal and uh, the president of Sri Lanka. Uh, then um, India came along. Pakistan was really the most reluctant because it was looking at it as to whether SARC will emerge as one more facet for India to dominate the region. Whereas many naysayers in the India were saying this would be a ganging of the, of the regional countries against India. But Pakistan, uh, the, the, if you read up the literature of the day, uh, was reluctant, but in the end, uh, it could not really say no, it went wrong. And then you realize that actually there are lots of advantages 
uh, to Pakistan joining uh, thou, uh, the SARC organization. I'll come, that, come to that in a while. The, but just about SARC. As I said earlier, SARC does not, is not equal to South Asia. South, SARC only facilitates our further discussion and more in-depth study and activism and uh, application of South Asian ideas. Yet, SARC, and SARC is also very weak because it is got a, it is a, it is a baby of eight foreign ministries. There is a consensus rule. Bilateral matters may not be brought up. And the secretary is extremely poorly funded. And it doesn't help that many of the foreign ministries, when they want to send away some senior deadwood, they send them to the SARC <laughs> secretariat in Kathmandu. Because the weather is good, it's an air-conditioned valley, uh, although a bit polluted these days. Um, and so you could get people to go easier if you wanted to get rid of them. So in that sense, SARC did not do well as an organization itself, mainly the consensus rule. Uh, and only two or three SARC Secretary Generals have shown the dynamism required for that posting, and they essentially retire extremely frustrated because you can't move eight foreign ministries with a consensus rule. The other thing that happened is that the idea of South Asia has of course been tackled by a lot of scholars, but a lot of the best scholars stayed away. Because especially from India and Pakistan and the larger countries of South Asia, the glamour of doing uh, you know, nuclear disarmament or India's, ex uh, India's rapprochement with the various countries, world powers, or Pakistan and it's having to deal with these great exciting times and this with the global powers coming in strong, giving you money in the billions of dollars. All of this meant that the mainstream academia and mainstream think tanks, quote unquote, did not, they sort of looked down at the SARC studies. I think that was unfortunate because that is one reason even today we need to continue with the job or pick up the job of conceptualizing South Asia. So, SARC, some, uh, the SARC organization itself was weak. It did get into a lot of activity, free trade activity, literary and literacy and education, terrorism, drug trafficking, people to people contact, uh, an audio visual exchange, telemedicine, poverty alleviation, etc. But none of them, and even a, there's even a $200 million uh, account for a SARC development fund. But none of these really have taken off. They just are essentially scarecrows of what they might be in the future. And you might say, if you're kind to the SARC organization, it keeps the flame alive for now, for somebody else to come along and make it work. But even as it is, SARC was providing the basis, the justification for civil society to engage in something. Because if the presidents themselves go to every uh, summit every year or two or three and wax eloquent about regional harmony, then it was okay for track two, track three, track four initiatives because you could not pillory them as anti-nationals. Because it comes close to that sometimes because you will be threatening existing state structures. So SARC therefore has a utility beyond the SARC organization giving legitimacy and scaffolding civil society activities as well. So, if that is the uh, nature of SARC, then uh, what is the danger today with the weakening of SARC uh, under the aegis of uh, Prime Minister Modi? Because he certainly has decided to completely look away from Pakistan. He will look at Afghanistan across from Pakistan, uh, certainly, but Pakistan is no-go area for Mr. Modi, and so what he has been doing is he has been promoting activities uh, and with the f enthusiasm of others, uh, other countries as well, uh, something known as uh, BBIN, that is Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal Motor Vehicle Agreement. Bangladesh has refused to sign on, but there is agreement that the three other countries, so that would be BIN, Bangladesh, India, Nepal Motor Vehicle Agreement, is proceeding. BIMSTEC is the organization uh, that brings in Thailand and Burma, Sri Lanka, and the eastern half of South Asia. That is also an organization now headquartered with the Secretary General in Bangladesh. Then there is something that is slightly at a lower pace, uh, 
uh, lower visibility. It is called BCIN, that is an attempt to bring in Bangladesh, China, India, and <coughs> <coughs> Myanmar. So there are sub-regional activities. Now the point is, the South Asia concept does not deny sub-regional uh, sub activities. In fact, I think South Asia as a concept should be one where let a hundred thousand flowers bloom, including regional and sub-regional organizations. So there is no denying it. My, present, my submission to this audience would simply be that, and I don't think this is a topic uh, that comes, that is extant today in South Asia. Not, not, people are not talking about it. So uh, I certainly myself have not read enough articles. There may be some in the Pakistani press, but we must ensure that the SARC idea as a whole uh, continues and the South Asia concept continues. Why? Because you cannot, if, if as I suggested in the beginning, and I will not go to details because I think I'm, I'm taking up my time here. If South Asia, the concept is a social justice project. If tens of millions of people are going to be drawn out of poverty for all that the South Asia vision encapsulates, then it is important to keep it alive. There is more study needed to prove my point, for sure. Number one. <coughs> Beyond that, what we have to keep in mind is South Asia does allow continuation of other activities, sorry, SARC does allow other activities to move ahead. So, if we are to say that SARC the South Asian concept is being weakened because SARC is weakened, be, weaken, being weakened because Mr. Modi does not want to deal with Pakistan. That is the, the line of argument. Then you got to, my suggestion is we got to turn it around. Why? Let's look at Pakistan. What is, uh, what is the, uh, what has been done wrong by that state or by that people? And here, the crux of the matter is world media, South Asian media is impacted by the New Delhi media. New Delhi media is impacted by South Bloc. And even the media that covers South Asia as a whole actually is headquartered, tends to be headquartered, international media tends to be headquartered in New Delhi. And therefore, they too are socialized and impacted by <coughs> what South Bloc has in mind. And occasionally, you might have an argument in opposition. But by and large, that is a very well packaged setup there. In that context, as far as Pakistan is concerned, if you, firstly, at the conceptual level, if you want to talk South, if you do not want to talk South Asia, then that is, you're welcome to that idea. We can talk about BBIN, we can talk about BIMSTEC, we can talk about Indian Ocean Rim. But as I suggested in the beginning, being a modern day citizen within the confines of the subcontinent means that you have to be linked to your history to be fulfilled in your identity. Which means that you also have to be linked to the valley of the Sindhu, of the Indus. And what you are proposing, deep down, something of rather violent, is that we will just not talk about this, this part of South Asia. It's better to <coughs> articulate ideas, challenge the state of Pakistan, challenge the people of Pakistan, if you will, and to say this is not the way to go, rather than to say we will just turn away from you and basically believe that you don't, um, pretend that you do not exist. That is what is happening today. And it's, in a way, I am proposing that there is a harm being done even as we do not recognize it's being done. That is probably uh, the point I'm making. So, talking about Pakistan, we talk about the need to separate because uh, the point I was making about the, uh, the New Delhi press is that the New Delhi press, with which, which impacts all of us, whether we're in New York or in Kathmandu or in San Francisco, they fail to make the distinction between the state and the people. And let us for a while think a little empathetically uh, over at the people of Pakistan. Because if you are looking at the kind of dislocations suffered by the 196 million people of sizable country in the world, then everything from sectarian violence to intelligence, surveillance, army rule, 
unstable, weak need uh, civilian governments, foreign interventions, massive corruption fueled by multi-billion dollars since the days of Reagan that has warped so much of politics. Then you got the provincial competition, then you got the sectarianism, and then you got the fundamental Islam. And then you got the murders of, inter murders of intellectuals and free thinkers. If you compare what's happening in Pakistan, granted India is a much larger country and the rest of South Asia, and if you for a moment consider that Sri Lanka has got over its problems by 2009, then there is no place in South Asia today where the people are as much pressured and dislocated uh, and in pain, if I will use the phrase, as the people of citizens of Pakistan. Therefore, firstly, going back now to the, my suggestion about um, uh, the need to keep Sark alive, one argument that I would make is the state of Pakistan is the one that has a lot of guilt that it has to carry from cross-border infiltration to all the weaknesses and the militarism, etc., that is within it. At the same time, and there may not be much changes in the policies of India or, Pakistan or Nepal or Bangladesh, which is right now quite angered by Pakistan. Nevertheless, let us just build up a little bit of who the people of Pakistan, what the people of Pakistan are suffering. That may allow us a slightly modulated view on the challenges facing SARC today. So I'm backing into SARC by using, uh, by speaking of my views on Pakistan. Now, specifically on SARC, what, what would we lose by continuing this policy of keeping Pakistan at arm's length? What we would do is, we would firstly probably be encouraging uh, the Pakistani fundamental elite to be more energized than ever before and look, to look more, ever more towards Saudi Arabia as they have since the time of Zia ul Haq. That would be the, the, the isolation from the rest of South Asia would might encourage that. And now there is a new entrant, China, with its 46 billion um, dollar loan to Pakistan. Uh, some, some Pakistanis worry that this is going to make Pakistan into a client state of China because nobody is giving Pakistan money now. The Americans are not, the Saudis are not reliable, so it's the Chinese and the Chinese are coming on strong, especially through the CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor that connects Kashgar to the Gwadar port and China's need for a land access that will prevent it from having to use the Malacca Straits. I think there are major shifts happening uh, in South Asia as we speak. India's, o uh, China's OBOR, One Belt, One Road policy, some of it to be welcome, some of it to be wary of. It is, at the very least, has overtaken or is in the process of overtaking Pakistan, the way I see it. So if we are continuing to isolate Pakistan, then are we doing good for South Asia? And are we doing good for the Pakistani people? And are we doing good for India? You would also, the more you isolate Pakistan and the more it becomes an antagonistic enemy, then you're also losing connection of the subcontinent to the gas fields of Iran, which once used to be called the Iran-Pakistan gas pipeline. Almost happened, then Mani Shankar Iyer, the, as Minister of Oil and Petroleum, was shown the door and it never happened. Likewise, there is talk now of TAPI, that's the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India gas pipeline. None of that will happen if you continue on this route. And uh, the, one of the ways that northern India will really economically proceed, besides having an open uh, connection with Pakistan and its market, the Pakistani market, is the access of natural gas over land rather than through tankers. But that is itself not being done as we speak. So it seems that. Uh, and when we speak of last point about Pakistan, and when we speak about Pakistani state, let us also for a while think, when we say Pakistan, let us also think Sindh, let us think Punjab, let us think Balochistan, let us think Pakhtunkhwa. Then a different Pakistan may just emerge in our mind that we can start the debate on is this right what we're doing because just India not participating or not encouraging SARC 
and therefore getting all the larger countries, the rest of the countries, Bhutan, Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, all of them agreeing and Afghanistan agreeing that yeah, let us not have our summit because Pakistan is a rogue state and the exact words uh, used was Pakistan must come to the path of cooperation instead of contradiction, says the foreign minister of, ambassador of Bangladesh. And the word used is recent escalation of terrorism, uh, imposed violence, the grave interference in the internal affairs by one country, these type of innuendos, but essentially being used because India has made its position clear. If India had not made its, its position clear, we would have had the summit. So we are stuck right now because the next summit has to, the 19th summit was scheduled for Pakistan in 2016. It has to happen. Uh, I would conclude my presentation therefore by suggesting that SARC is important to keep alive. Uh, to keep SARC alive, we need to have a summit. Uh, to have a summit, we need to ensure that there is a debate, including about the role and the place of the Pakistani state and the Pakistani people. And that debate has to touch the literati and the glitterati within the ring road in New Delhi. Without doing that, we cannot get that debate even going. And then that debate may first get us some some, some negative reactions, but in the end, uh, I see that there is no way for us to proceed other than by complementing the nation states of South Asia with an idea of a uh, regional space that is South Asia. That will be complementary to the identities <coughs> and it will fulfill our need to link ourselves to our past rather than only as a Nepali or an Indian, Indian after 1947 that is, and a Pakistani and a Sri Lankan. So looking to the future, if Modi's policy would bring Pakistan, if the, uh, with the, if the present attitude of Narendra Modi about SARC would bring Pakistan back into SARC, then I would say let's try it. But there doesn't seem to be any hope that this attitude and this policy will bring Pakistan back. So what do we do? Are we now going to therefore maintain the SARC secretariat, maintain the fiction of SARC and wait for some regime change in Pakistan? That may be a long time waiting. So it seems what is required instead because Mr. Modi, Narendra Modi is a dynamic and headstrong leader. Somewhere a debate has got to start which will reach his ears to say you are dynamic, you are great, you might want to suggest, you might want to think, you know, and you are, because you have consolidated your power base, you come from a state, you may not have understood the power of nation state identity, sovereign status and ultranationalism in neighboring states. But now that you have ruled for a few years, you may realize that the reality is such that you cannot turn events in the region as a whole. And therefore, perhaps you want to Take a dramatic turn, just the way you took that flight to Lahore. On the way back from, you landed in Lahore for a birthday greeting to Nawaz Sharif on the way back from Kabul. Some things dramatic like that. Just the way Donald Trump can get away with anything, so can you. <laughs> and so the suggestion would be perhaps because your current policy will not bring Pakistan back, South Asia as a whole is an idea worth nurturing. You yourself think so because you talk of a SARC satellite. You talk about, you brought all the presidents and prime ministers to your inaugural. So that means you're, you do have an instinct that feels for South Asia. And after all, we may not call it Akhanda Bharat, but there was a South Asia uh, in the past that some called Akhanda Bharat. And so we need to revive it for the same sense of history that you seem to have. And to do this, I would suggest, ultimately, I made the point in the beginning uh, that there need to be further study of the concept of South Asia. Some people call it the ontology of South Asia. Uh, and I would say that <coughs> institutes such as the South Asia Institute here at Berkeley uh, could study individual countries and individual societies and subsets of those societies and languages and cultures as a, uh, in cumulat and cumulatively that forms one South Asia. I think that is very important. And given that a lot of the funding that comes for South Asia Institutes all over the world, now that 
the business folks in Pakistan, Bangladesh, and uh, India, and hopefully soon enough, Sri Lanka. <laughs> Nepal will take a long time yet. <laughs> now that they're able to endow chairs, <laughs> I think that is one way to go into depths of Nepali so, uh, of South Asian society. At the same time, we must look at another stream of study, complementary for sure, that looks at South Asia as a whole, and probably study more than anything else the economics of South Asia. Because that is where you will find South Asia is probably, as I suggested, a social justice project. And for that, we first must communicate with Mr. Modi. Thank you. Questions, please. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, it is, uh, it's a pleasure listening to you and you know I can't agree more about the Delhi issue because I'm four thousand kilometers away from Delhi, much farther than you. Mm -hmm. So so I can understand you know, where that comes from. Um, you know the what is the kind of bandage I mean, because there are different vantage points in what we call as development, you know. So the the social justice is one and the second one is uh, in the economics. I think basically this was that economy is central. So I think that's the kind of dominant vantage point which always works, and you know that's where it, it has a problem and a contradiction with this kind of you know social justice ideas uh, that we're dealing in. And second question is you know how sovereign is the South Asian state you know in the international context? Because the European <coughs> Union can still be a kind of supranational state because they have their kind of economic independence and, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, cooperation that will actually kind of bring in something. But, you know, we, we get, we, uh, I don't know where we were ever sovereign or we will ever be sovereign in the kind of economic, you know, uh, geopolitical, you know, environment that we are in. So, so would we ever have that, you know, uh, possibility? And the third and last question is the rise of the right wing. Which is actually a phenomenon around the world and, and in India. I think so the Indian state is ultra national. And that is the kind of existence of the Indian state now. And the the Prime Minister, as you told, you know, because from childhood is actually kind of born and brought up with this kind of internalization. You know. So um, so it's very difficult to kind of <coughs> Get out of that also, and so I think, and and it is very favorable. The, the whole global climate is so favorable to the kind of right wing, you know, this kind of ultra national feelings also. So I would the way I would reply to all three of you briefly is last point first uh, is that the the lack of historical, <coughs> of course, there are different. Uh, nobody has a right to any one history, but the way uh, history is being appropriated and rewritten by the extreme right the way it was never appropriated thus by the center or the left. Uh, I think that is one danger because the whole idea of South Asia implies a sense of history that the right wing in my view does not have as yet yeah. and how do we educate them? That's a big problem. The second point about economics. Uh, I think my uh, suggestion as I ended by talking economics is that my Understanding of social justice may be slightly different from what uh, you understood me to say. For me, you need to have uh, well-being and income and equity. And so my suggestion is that South Asia as a whole, if there were studies by very committed scholars, especially economists, we'll find that you will have much more uh, income for the people of South Asia especially the northern half, because we, can, we tend to think of all of South Asia, but the problem child of South Asia is the northern South Asia. From, from Sindh and Punjab to Bangladesh, including Nepal and Uttar Pradesh, Bihar. That area, all of it is actually the rimland. And synergies across the borders, uh, nobody has even, I think, done a real study other than <coughs> some track two initiatives which have got some figures. But serious study would mean that there is more income for everybody when there is South Asian regionalism. Your first point was? Your first point? 
I'll come back to it then. <laughs> no, I think I got your first point. I missed yeah. your middle point, but I. Yeah. Lauren. Two questions. I mean, one is the pragmatic one, which is that one could argue that uh, not only the BJP, but Indian political parties in general uh, are not as interested in questions of state as questions of party, and and it's it's um, and uh, so it, it it's hard to imagine a scenario in which uh, interest in South Asia at this moment. Uh, could emerge, but you've argued for some, and so it seems to be possible. But it, 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 it but that, but that was often at the level of country, not party, and it's, it's, um, and I'm not sure that's only an issue of the BJP. And it's, it's the more interesting question. One of the nice things about the talk was it, it didn't do several things, and one thing it didn't do was to say, which you could argue quite easily, that South Asia is a category of American internationalism in the Cold War. It's a dividing of the world into zones for US domination in the Cold War context. Now this is both, this is an old argument of the left that has become an argument of the right, of course. And, um, and right now in California, it's a big argument around how textbooks should be written. And the challenge for scholars of struggling with the relationship between contemporary India and historical India and the ways in which South Asia has become a way for scholars to try to address pedagogically the complex mapping of contemporary countries onto a deep history, which is uh, transnational yeah. different, you know. And, and what has emerged is a very interesting critique. I mean, it's a complicated critique for many of us because it's penned by the BHP. Um, it comes with a lot of violence surrounding it. Nonetheless, it's heartfelt by a lot of people who are not dumb. And it, uh, I know we're responding to various kinds of racism in US pedagogy historically and so on and so forth. So it's, it's a, a um, but it's a time where uh, not only therefore is the category <coughs> of South Asia being questioned in the Indian American media and in the <coughs> Indian media, uh, but having to do with the ways in which the VHP entangles itself in history debates in, in the rest of the world. Yeah. So that's been, an, I'm just curious what you, have to say about yeah. that, and, and then the last piece of it is is um, in addition to uh, well, that's not possible. All right, I, I think uh, California leads in the international discourse when it comes to cha having um, a challenge to the term South Asia, mm -hmm. because I haven't actually read that anywhere else internationally other than within India. Yeah. Well, um, well, this map, for example. Of course, that's what I want to say is that my sense, you know, having been at the helm of this institute for a while is that there it is more there is it's by no means a general rule, but it seems to be there's more interest by donors, people you speak to, in nation based yes. uh, sub centers. At this moment, and that's by no means a generality. There's a lot of these very, very complex funding communities and full of lots of, of brilliant ideas and interests, but but the general sense is that there's much more <laughs> to be had if you're trying to keep yourself alive through the privatization of the public university yeah. by feeding into uh, new nationalisms. Yeah, I think that. And uh, uh, longings for. for I, I think one, one, one way to uh, uh, respond to your point about uh, the BJP and India and how BJP is taking things a, a certain direction, but I think all other parties are also in the same boat in India because we have to accept the point that. India is actually most of South Asia. By population, by size, by if you, you know, even though the outlier countries are large, yeah. but still India with its 1.3 billion is massive. Yeah. So they, in a way, don't feel the need to look at it. So how to change that discourse? One way to change that discourse <coughs> is by talking <coughs> therefore of Uttar Pradesh, especially Purvanchal, yeah. talking about Bihar, talking about Assam, talking about Tripura, talking about uh, Rajasthan. So to, and these are all powerful states. So I think we need to therefore do some more study on how to break this logjam that New Delhi creates for us in talking about South Asia and cross-border. Um, your other point about, well, about the term South Asia. I mean, we don't even have to get into where the term South Asia came because after India appropriates, modern day nation state India appropriates for itself the name India, which is from history, historical times, then others have to call some, themselves something else, and then, but all of the others were also part of ancient and historical India. So you had to come up with a name. The people who came up with it first probably 
were the strategists in the United States because when they looked at the southern part of Asia, you couldn't call all of it India, so you had to call it. And this is now what we have to educate the Californian Hindutvadis by telling them, what would you do? I mean, Pakistan, where uh, where Akhan Bharat began, presumably, it's <laughs> it's in a different country. So how can you call that India? You can't call it India. So these are the kind of arguments where I think California is probably the best place to start it. So even if the funding stream, by and large, is going vertically by country and subsets within the country, I think there has to be an effort to at least get one stream of study going there. But I, I, I think I agree with you entirely that, and that's why I mentioned it in my presentation as well, the money is not there. And within South Asia, the money is also not there because we wasted millions of dollars or tens of millions of dollars over the 80s, 90s to the 2000s. Because that's when the donor community had flush pockets. And they were funding a lot of South Asia activities. But these are all former diplomats, retired diplomats who just used it for junkets. So essentially, you found South Asia in the uh, airline lounges of South Asia. <laughs> and as I used to say, all of South Asia is made up of maybe 7,000 people, and they meet each other all the time. <laughs> the point I didn't make earlier, <laughs> let me just make this point. What we need to make, what we have to do is make South Asia a political proposition, that it is threatening to some. And the reaction to this map, recently in a debate in the University of Udaipur was heartening to me because it created a dissonance. Just the way the India versus South Asia debate in California among the, some of the uh, Indian folks, and I don't, I don't criticize them. Some of them were, apparently were even crying that our identity is being taken from us. Well, we have to educate them. Likewise, uh, if there is no controversy in California or in New Delhi or in Udaipur, this map was seen as anti-India. That's because we are programmed to think of this as India because the peninsula is India, uh, present-day India nation state. But there is Tibet here, for God's sake. There is China, there is Nepal. Everybody is upside down. It's not just India. But the, by and large, the New Delhi is programmed to see this as India upside down. And so I think uh, it's a challenge for us. And perhaps I would tell you, Lauren, that it's when we're down that we must rise. <laughs> And I, I have a um, question. You, um, you know, say, talk about the importance of, um, you know, the states, uh, UP, Bihar, etc., and um, as a way of, sh you know, shifting agency from the center to the periphery. And if I understood you correctly, you sort of said basically that happened successfully in Nepal. But couldn't you say that actually that hasn't really happened? And the Anchals and the Jilas in Nepal do not have the degree of autonomy and power that they need, and there continues to be far too much power centralized in the hands of the political elite in Kathmandu? That is why the Nepali experiment is so interesting, because the world hasn't reported it, so we don't know. And plus, the world mm -hmm. reports what New Delhi reports, which is that there is enormous uh, in injustices being perpetrated by this new constitution. But what this constitution does, and what it doesn't do, there are problems with this constitution, we should have a workshop on this someday in, in Berkeley, because uh, that itself would, te would be very educational to all. But what this const what it, uh, it is being pilloried, as I said recently in the Times of India, it is being pilloried for the wrong reasons. There are problems with it because it is a, a rights-based constitution. It's written by politicians. It is not written by jurists and ac academicians. So pretty much you're giving everything to everybody. And it's not the kind of tight constitutional document that you can implement. But that's a problem for tomorrow. For now, we are going now, and one reason Shanta and myself, we are heading back quicker than we would otherwise, uh, is because we want to vote in the local elections. We haven't had local elections for 19 years. Mm -hmm. This local entities in Nepal, we call them Stanya Taha, because Stanya, uh, um, Stanya Nikaya would mean Gavi Sanji, the village development community and the uh, committee and the DDCs, the district development committee. Those are the old units. The old units were essentially developmental units that were spending money given to them by the state. They were elected, but that was it. But the new units actually are autonomous by themselves. So what in Nepal is trying to begin with is something that is interesting that needs to be studied. We are, if we are successful, we can actually teach a thing or two for to the rest of South Asia mm -hmm. because it's a different model altogether. However, the, when when I was talking about the units of governance vis-a-vis -vis Nepal. 
I'm mainly talking about the size and the people. Because for me, whether you're talking about human rights or whether you're talking about uh, economics, it's the number of people that counts. The number of people within Nepal having a sense of their own autonomous uh, ability to decide is essentially the same as the rights uh, as the people of Assam. But they don't have the autonomous ability to decide. Like on 1992, I got involved in the radio revolution in Nepal. Nepal right now has 300 FM radios, and each of them can carry news and current affairs. Nobody else in South Asia can do it. How was it that we managed it in Nepal? That is something that an Assam as activist could not even dream about, would not even get started. So I, I feel that uh, there is, for the kind of regionalism that I propose, we must keep in mind that Nepal is sovereign, because I don't want anybody coming and donk, bonking me on the head saying, you're anti-national, you are trying to equate Nepal with Assam. Because that's always a problem in when you think of these ideas that everybody's talking nationalism, nationalism. But I'll say that I want to communicate not only with Delhi, I want to communicate with Lucknow. I want to communicate with Patna. I want to have deals as a sovereign country with a non-sovereign entity called Bihar. These are the kinds of new formulae and formulation that we should be talking about. The first question is sovereignty, actually, EU and South Asia. Yeah, yeah. Well, as I suggested in my presentation, I don't consider uh, South Asia going the way of EU. In fact, I think EU was reaching higher. South Asia must go lower into the uh, smaller units. And that is my that is essentially my own hypothesis of the way South Asia should evolve, not a supranational entity. Ultimately, once you've got uh, Tamil Nadu energized, a Sindh energized, an Assam energized, and Nepal and Bangladesh as similar sized units but sovereign, once you have a new kind of South Asia, then they may evolve a kind of a European Union type of a formula for these entities based on South Asian specificity. But then for the beginning right now, I'm thinking one should not think of South Asia as trying to emulate ASEAN or EU or NAFTA or any other uh, conglomeration because South Asia is different from all of them. And the one aspect that makes South Asia different is the asymmetry of the nation states. Mm. India as a humongous and central state makes South Asia entirely different from every other. In Europe, you've got Germany and France as the large entities. In uh, ASEAN, you may have Indonesia and Malaysia, but nothing like this. So to you think know, of my, it. My question was, you know, and, and you know, I think Dawn was also telling, I think there's a lot of post-colonial kind of, you know, intervention into this mm -hmm. sector, especially economics, you know, yeah. and the donors. And yeah. you know, so are we kind of sovereign enough to kind of even decide if we, if we are all good and, you know, uh -huh. and democratic and all? Even with that, do we have that? I think so that that compare so that's a special case in a way compared to the other I, I think that if we one is are we sovereign vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world yeah that's right, right? Yeah. and so I would say that state, you know? and that remains a problem challenge for the South Asia that people like me are envisioning but at the very least we can have a better space within where there is more economy of scale there is more synergy but I, I think uh, the area that you're alluding to, that the larger world of, uh, of world exploitation, let's call it, that's happening, yeah, that will continue. All, even Monday in fina you know, finance, you know, the, 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 the world of finance is actually controlling this whole, yeah. you know, I even so sovereign state. I think that challenge will remain even after the South Asia, the kind I propose, yeah. but we'll have to work with that. But I vote for your map. I'm at the top now. Kerala is the country of the South Asian gods. <laughs> you know. and the, but the people who are happiest with this map yeah. are uh, the people of Matara in, in northernmost and upmost Sri Lanka. Uh, it's, a ta it's a town next to Gaul. Okay. It's, it's Matara, the village of Matara. So you should be from Matara to be absolutely happy. But I can tell you that. As an Indian, I think, you know. I'm at the top. You are, you are. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other point. As I do copy editing, what we try to do is we try to emphasize people's origins outside of nation state. Like I'm an editor from Kathmandu. Right? You are a? 
Trivandrum. Science is from Trivandrum. There you are. But uh, since you mentioned this map, I have brought five or six maps. I don't have them with me. I will hand them over to Alex, have it uh, sent over. And anybody, especially you, are deserving of one. <laughs> but anybody would like to. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave the map here, and if you iron the creases and put it up, it becomes a good I conversation know, a piece. Great, so I, I had a question. So with uh, politics being very narrowly focused and win-win at any cost, and global populist moving, rising throughout the world, right? And if you look at cases in Nepal, if you look at cases in India, it's like trying finding strategies to come to power. So the, the highest, uh, I mean the least common demand is trying to excite your base, fuel nationalism or religious kind of uh, notions, right? To come to power. So given that, what I, what I see is for this to work politically, it should not just be popular leaders in each of these nation states, but more like statesmen, like in the in the time of Nehru, there was BP Koirala in Nepal. There are others even in Pakistan. So, how do you see those kind of statesmen coming from each of these nations to right. make this a viable proposition? Well, it, I'll repeat something that I've said often, and I've written I've written this in several articles of mine, that you can't buy a stateswoman or, or statesman off the Patpadini supermarket shelf. <laughs> you know, that so they, what, they, what what kind of what kind of situation? Given, because the economic and the donor classes are going to drive a lot of these activities, and we can't stop that, right? That's that's the general trend nowadays. And um, nonprofits, think tanks, and uh, social activism is also rising in South Asia, but some part of it is still funded by vested interests, especially from the Western countries. So given this situation, what kind of... Um, environment needs to be well, there. Well, uh, what I would say is, uh, I mean, let me, let me put a, throw you a googly, as they say. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that Nepal is not doing too badly. If you take Nepal as an example, mm -hmm. look at the kind of challenges thrown the way of Nepal, and look at the way our politicians, they are up to shenanigans every other day. You see what Mr. Deoba and Prachanda Pushpakamal Dal did the, uh, three days ago. Mm -hmm. But look at what they have managed. They, we've got an earthquake, mm -hmm. right? and the earthquake reconstruction is terrible. Then we got a five months, uh, with, then we adopted a constitution, uh, a constitution that's going to be very difficult to, uh, to implement, but nevertheless, it was among the finest exercises in terms of constitutional politics. It was a constituent assembly that adopted it, and 92% were voting to the assembly, and 78% voted for the constitution, yet India decides it doesn't like it. Mm -hmm. So what does India do? A blockade. Right? Firstly, they come in two days before the elections and try to force the politicians of Nepal to not to go, go for it. But then they decide to, and the Nepali politician, they will say, ha ha, yes, hajur, 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 and they go and do what they want. <laughs> so you can also look at how sly they are in trying to save the national <laughs> terrain. <laughs> then five months of a blockade, three to five times more economically devastating than the, block, than the earthquake. So therefore, you must call it the great blockade, mm -hmm. like the great earthquake, right? Mm -hmm. Then after that, we thought, okay, the, now the Indian government could not stand it. They, the mm -hmm. Nepali people are too resilient. The Nepali politicians finagle their way, and we are overcome. The India backs away because the blockade was India, mm -hmm. and India switched it off. India switched it on. Mm -hmm. So that was success. Then suddenly, all the problems about implementation, the first constitution, first uh, local elections. I won't say India as New Delhi, but certain forces of India that have power over Nepal, they uh, decided that these local elections cannot happen unless there is a blackmailing, success at blackmailing to say, change the constitution the way we wanted it originally mm -hmm. in terms of provincial demarcations, and which in my view will not actually benefit the people of the plains the way it will benefit India. Mm -hmm. And so, but look at it again, India has failed three times. It failed in the blockade, it failed in the constitution, and it failed in uh, going in for uh, local elections, which is happening next week. So my suggestion is that we cannot create, uh, we cannot lie, we keep waiting for uh, states people, mm -hmm. <laughs> statesmen and women. Mm -hmm. We just have to keep doing what we're doing. And I'm suggesting to you that 
a format might sometimes make a difference. Therefore, the format of Nepal, and this is, I speak without having a base in political science, is a format of the size of Assam, given more autonomy, will probably sort its problems out better than always being under the centralized umbrella of New Delhi. And I'm not proposing Assam be independent, not at all. I'm just saying that additional quotient of autonomy will almost replicate what Nepal can do uh, seriously as a sovereign state. I believe that this is an area, it is of course a different terrain, but it fits in with my own ideas about South Asia as well. That these are areas that people in, in mm. India, nobody is talking, nobody is studying because the power of the state is so much and the ostracism that you will, you will, uh, you will uh, be impacted with. It may even happen in universities around the world. I don't know because the Indian uh, intellectual elite are programmed to say certain things certain ways. And there are certain areas they will not go. Mm -hmm. And I think that is also defining areas. One of the areas they will not go is actually working. There have been works on deepening federalism, but not the way that I think it should be. Last point I'll make is, because it's related, and I wanted to answer this in relation to your question. We must make uh, South Asia a much more threatening, pro uh, 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 let's say, idea to those who would do politics as usual. Mm -hmm. And how do you make it threatening? And I, I use the word threatening, I wish I'd used another term. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you make people sit up and listen? Uh, politicians, because you have to politicize the notion of South Asia. And here is the way. The way is, go to it through the vernacular. Thus far, it is those 7,000 people writing in English to each other, at each other, mm -hmm. around South Asia. Mm -hmm. And they do meet all the time in airline lounges, I mm -hmm. guarantee, guarantee you. So what you need is, you need to start talking about South Asia in Hindi, and in Urdu, and in Sinhala, in Nepali, and in Bangla. Nepali and uh, Bangla in Bangladesh, they do pick it up a little bit, but not enough because we're not able to, because the academics have not done their job, we're not able to justify it saying that here, if you have a South Asian vision, which also means bilateral, trilateral, multilateral, all South Asia, it'll make your life better. That is what we have to politicize. And I agree with everybody here, I'm sure that that's a tough ta task, easier said than done. Yeah. <laughs> no. Are you emphasizing that uh, both regional cooperation between states, which are important, in that not much has happened, so in a way, in the state that we are in, we should have much more effort at regional cooperation. Uh, this is important. At the same time, uh, you're also talking about the need to for the devolution of power within nation states. Is, is that your essence? Absolutely. That is my, it's, it's one continuum is what I'm trying to say. Right. Because when we speak about South Asia, people tend to immediately focus on, oh, idea is a, all countries together as one entity, the South Secretariat leading towards a European Union type of formula. But I'm saying we go the other way. That is the South Asia that I think is real, not the other way. Last question, please. And afterwards, there is cheese and uh, wine, and everybody's welcome to stay around and to engage Kanakji. But please, your question. In Nepal, um, I was a listener to a conversation, a somewhat extended conversation, at Tribhavan University and ISER, the Institute for Advanced Com uh, Communication, Education, and Research, about the need to move away from South Asia studies to Hamal, Hamalian studies. And I, I, don't I didn't understand it well then. I saw my colleagues, uh, I, that's not my field at all, struggling to find a path in terms of new scholarship with that model, with that paradigm of Hamalian or Hamal studies. But I wonder how that well, I think if you could give me any insight into that discussion. Okay, to begin with, Himal's own idea of regionalism came from our earlier avatar as a Himalayan magazine. Oh, yeah. That is how we learned to do what I call cross-border journalism. Because we were covering the Himalaya from, uh, from the Hindu Kush to the Arakan uh, and to uh, the mountains of Yunnan, including Nepal, Bhutan, Sikkim, Tibet, uh, and uh, Uttarakhand, and 
the Indian Himalaya, the Northeast. Um, I didn't remark enough on the Northeast, by the way, uh, just because I, it is a topic that is dear to me, but uh, I'll keep that for another time. But when we think of South Asia, uh, Pakistan and India, are, or the India that we know, northern half of India in particular, are so much similar that we tend to forget the others that fall out of the core focus. One of them is Northeast. Let me leave that aside and uh, respond to your point. The Himalayan uh, studies is an important uh, arena because there are countries within South Asia which are in the Himalayan region and they have specific issues, specific challenges uh, for being mountain communities, for being diverse, for being separated, and then being impacted by global economics and subcontinental, or in the most case, Indian economics hitting you. So there is a need for a Ladakhi to be talking to a Arun Arunachali, a Nepali, etc. But then mid-hills and the high Himal, and then the plains, the Tarai, or the Shivalik, these all come as a unit. So to some extent, I think Himalayan studies is very important. It tends to be dominated by Tibetan studies. Mm -hmm. So it's very important, or again, to go by population. Where is the population density? And you also want to study that. But because of the exoticism of Tibet, Tibet gets first priority in studies. And then Bhutan, because it is supposed to be Shangri-La. Uh, I can talk about that. I can talk about that another time. But so I think there is uh, every reason to study the Himalayan region for its specific challenges and possibilities, like tourism. Equity, high-end tourism, income, and equity is something that a Ladakhi should be talking to a Kashmiri, should be talking to a Hunza person, to a Kashmiri person. So I have no doubt about the need for that study. But that does not supplant South Asian studies. That's all. Thank you very much, Kanakji.